Good evening and welcome uh, to our latest art event, Limitless, Pushing the Boundaries of Muscle and Mind. My name is Tiago Marques and I'm gonna be your host for this evening. I'm a PhD student in visual neuroscience here at the Champagne Mall Research, uh, usually trying to, working in the lab, trying to find out what the cortex is doing. And I bet uh, some of you are probably wondering what does that have to do with limits and the topic of tonight's event. Well, not much. But when I'm not in the lab, uh, there's a high uh, chance that you're gonna find me uh, running um, or cycling or swimming while I'm training for uh, long distance uh, races and triathlons. And uh, many times we chase our own limits, but other times limits faces quite abruptly. Uh, three years ago, while I was training for my first very long distance triathlon, also known as Ironman, I was ran over by an over, overspeed car here in Lisbon just six days before the race. Uh, luckily, uh, I didn't break uh, anything and there was uh, no other car involved in the accident because the car, when it hit me, I was projected up into the air and I literally fell on my bottom uh, on the road. Uh, as I said, I didn't suffer any serious injury, but the muscles on my back absorbed all the impact uh, and I couldn't move for one week. Uh, and I was devastated because there was this race that I had spent so much time and I had trained so hard and I, could not, I was not able to compete on it. So this was a time where a limit faced me. Um, still, as soon as I was able to move, I was on the stationary bike, cycling as hard as I could, and as when I started being able to walk, I started running in agony, and once I regained some skin on my bottom that was left on the asphalt, I was on the swimming pool uh, swimming, and two months after that accident, I finished my first Ironman under 12 hours. So this story uh, uh, was, uh, you know, this story was the moment where I, I as I said, I faced the limit, uh, but I'm not the only one, and there are many, many people that during the course of their jobs or their activities, they are constantly facing their own limits. So we asked a few people about an episode where they face a limit and how they overcome it, and uh, this is how they replied. Há três meses atrás tive a situação mais desafiante e difícil da minha vida. Estava numa expedição na África do Sul, perto de Cape Town, a fazer uma escalada com um amigo meu belga. A 100 metros de altura tive uma queda de 25 metros diretamente contra a parede com as minhas costas. Fraturei a homoplata em vários sítios, parti 11 costelas, fiz um pneu meu motórax, parti duas vértebras e tive 20 horas à espera de um helicóptero e basicamente estou aqui para contar a história. Há um momento foi num incêndio florestal em Bombing de Basto, em que foram 48 horas de combate, em que o, o sítio de onde vinha a abastecer água, até levar a água aos meus companheiros, aos meus pais, que estão na frente de fogo, demorava cerca de hora e meia a fazer o percurso, por meio de, de terreno mesmo uh, ingrido. E, e nesse momento cheguei mesmo ao limite e tive que pedir a um colega uh, meu para trazer o carro porque eu já não, já não, já não conseguia, já não, não conseguia trazer. I was working in A &E on nights and I was six months pregnant at the time and I remember not having had a break for over six hours, no food, water or, or toilet break. And there were seven people around me who were all extremely sick and dying. Um, and it was extremely stressful. Um dos maiores desafios que tive mais recentemente no Campeonato do Mundo, em agosto de 2017, foi após a conquista da medalha de prata em K1000 metros, Uh, ficar fo estar focado uh, para a finalíssima que tinha de cá para uns 5 mil metros e uh, estar relaxado, tranquilo e conseguir uh, para conseguir ter a minha melhor performance nessa, nessa prova. Uh, 
para ultrapassar esta que foi a noite mais difícil da minha vida, eu fiz uma viagem no tempo, portanto imaginei-me já feliz e saudável de volta a Portugal, junto à minha família, junto aos meus amigos, e durante a espera pelo helicóptero concentrei-me em tentar tranquilizar as pessoas que estavam à minha volta, os três amigos que estavam a escalar comigo, e tentei mostrar-me sempre forte, nunca pensar na morte, sempre ser otimista, com pensamentos positivos, e claro, para sair da parede, utilizei todos os conhecimentos que tenho de escalada e de resgate. No, no seguimento da, da situação, depois de pedir a um, um, a um colega meu que passasse para essa viatura onde eu estava e ele trazer a viatura de volta para, para o quartel, que já não consegui mesmo eh, sequer. Eu só acordei mesmo quando cheguei à Aveiro. The way that I personally was able to overcome such a stressful shift was by relying heavily on all the training I'd received since the years that I'd qualified, um, all the simulation exercises that we perform in hospitals, and having a stepwise approach to managing sick patients. I delegated uh, responsibilities to other team members and pulled in different specialities within the hospital to help in the a &E department that night. Para conseguir o objetivo que eu tinha em mente de, no capo 5mm, após a conquista da medalha prata no capo 1000, eh, comecei a, a pensar naquilo que queria, a eh, pensar na, na prova, eh, tentar relaxar, descansar o máximo possível, focado única e exclusivamente na prova eh, de 5mm, eh, normalmente é o que eu faço, prova a prova, eh, cada vez eh, focado sempre no, no próximo objetivo, e nunca a pensar eh, no dia a seguir ou na prova a seguir. Pensar única e exclusivamente de prova a prova. So, I hope that you just, uh, if, if you just saw what I, what I saw, um, as I said, limits are something that uh, many of us deal uh, during the course of their activities. And these were just some of the videos we received to the questions. We have more that we're gonna show later on the event tonight. Uh, but there's, uh, as I should have said earlier, this event uh, is not only being uh, organized by uh, AR and the Champagne uh, Foundation, but this one in particular, where it's a joint collaboration with the Volvo Ocean Race, uh, who Uh, the uh, sailors that compete in the Volvo Ocean Race are people that are constantly uh, dealing with extreme situations and facing their limits. Uh, and uh, Volvo Ocean Race prepared a video uh, that somehow uh, shows some of the struggles uh, that these uh, sailors go through, and I would like to share it with you. Ever sailed the Southern Ocean, really, not raced the Southern Ocean. So you don't know what's going to be down there. We know we're going into ice. It's blowing 35 knots, you're doing 25 knots of boat speed. The navigator sticks his head up the hatch and he'll say, Iceberg on the bow. The heart starts going and sweat's coming down the back of your neck. Your feet are ice blocks, your hands are like ice blocks. Your face is raw red from the salt spray. The boat is rocking down. One of the last true human adventures. It's both frightening and exhilarating. You're so scared that you almost freeze up, but at the same time you have a smile on your face. The Southern Ocean is the ultimate playground. evolves around its, its people and its boats, nature will always still rule that race.
So I hope that you saw just just a snapshot of some of the struggles that these sellers face. And as you've seen, uh, there are many, many struggles, and we're going to hear about them later on this evening. Uh, but some of them are more of a, a physical nature. And, and those are the ones that I can personally relate to more, and those are the ones that I'm going to be uh, talking uh, over the next minute. Um, so let's, let's do the following. Let's imagine imagining that you're trying to, to catch a bus. There's a bus on the, on the bus station, and it's just right there in front of you. You can see it, uh, but you're st it's a little bit far, and then you start running, uh, trying to, to get on it. And as you, as you continue running, your legs starting to, are starting to feel a bit stiff, and they're starting to hurt, and your speed starts dropping, uh, and you don't understand why this is it, and, and it, there's this thought of on, on your head, like, I'm gonna catch that bus, I'm gonna catch that bus, but then somehow, uh, although you really want to, you start slowing down, and eventually the bus just leaves the bus station uh, with the driver sadistically just driving away, uh, completely discarding your heroic attempt to get on the bus. Um, so you're frustrated with the situation, uh, and you start wondering about a few questions. So why couldn't I run faster? Uh, I'm able to run fast for some uh, short sprints. Why wasn't I able to maintain the speed until I, I, catch, I caught the bus? What stopped me? Why was there this moment where I could no longer continue running and I started walking? And why are my legs hurting so much? Um, so these are questions that uh, maybe some of you have uh, uh, come across when you were trying to, to catch uh, uh, a bus going away. Uh, but these are questions that people that, that athletes and people that run marathons uh, face uh, during their races. So I'm, I'm no professional uh, marathon runner, but I, I, I've done a few marathons. Uh, and I would like to share with you a recent story uh, that took place uh, when I ran the Lisbon Marathon just 15 days ago uh, in uh, October 15th. So uh, I had, uh, it was, I wasn't at my best in terms of training, uh, but I was very motivated and I, I had set a goal to try to do the, the, the marathon in three hours, 20 minutes. And um, if I would be able to run the 42 kilometers at the constant speed, it would translate to 12, 0.65 kilometers per hour. So this was what I had to do if I wanted to achieve my goal. So it was a beautiful day. The start uh, was in Qashqais, blue sky, uh, fantastic weather, and I'm there with thousand, thousands of other athletes in the starting line, and I'm all pumped up. Then I hear this gun signaling the start, and I, I just, I, I, I'm full of like good feelings uh, and really confident uh, about this day and this race. So, because of this, I start running very, very fast. Uh, so, the, 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 the first part of the race, we run towards west, towards Ginshu, uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful road along the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and I'm, I'm doing a pace that I know I cannot keep. If I run a marathon at 14 kilometers per hour, I'm gonna do it in three hours, which I hope that one day I'll do it, but now I know that my legs cannot, are not up to that task. So I, I start at this pace uh, because I'm very confident, and then I kind of continue, although there was this uh, nature call that happened here at kilometer nine. Uh, but still I recover, and I see like, oh, I'm feeling very confident, I'm running fast, uh, so maybe this three hour, 20 minutes is, 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 is quite easy, maybe I'll be able to do faster. So I kind of moved my goal to, to do it under 315, which now corresponded to running the marathon just under 13 kilometers per hour. So until kilometer 22, I'm always above uh, that uh, constant speed that I will try to, to, to target. Uh, but then there's a series of uphills, uh, and my speeds, my velocity starts dropping. Uh, my legs are starting to feel tired and hurting, but I'm still uh, running, just barely touching that, that line. And I know because I ran faster in the first kilometers, if I can continue this pace until the end, I'll know that I'll do the marathon in three hours 50. 
So this is the only thing I need to do, is just keep running at this pace. And I know that from this moment until the finishing line in Praça do Comércio in the city center of Lisbon, it's going to be flat all the way. So there are no more uphills. I just need to run 20 kilometers at around 13 kilometers per hour. And how, how hard is that? It's, come on, it's not that difficult. But around kilometer uh, 32, something happened. Uh, and uh, what happened is something that runners usually call the wall. Uh, it's this mythical f figure uh, in running uh, when you know what you need to do and your body just refuses to do what you want it to do. So I know that I need to run at a certain speed and I know that I can run at that speed, but my legs refuse to run at the speed that I'm telling them to run. And I try to push it harder only to see my speed dropping even further. And by kilometer 38, I'm reaching almost 11 kilometers per hour, which is a speed that I, I would be really disappointed to if I f would cross the finishing line running at that speed. Uh, but as I get closer and closer to the finishing line, and I, I'm approaching the city center of Lisbon, there's more and more people cheering on the streets, and they're shouting, come on, it's just so, you're almost there. It's less than five kilometers. You can do it. And, and then something happens. Um, a, mo a moment ago, each step would cause me agony, and I would feel like energy draining from my body with each step. And now I feel lighter, and with each step, I feel more confident, as if I, I was getting energy from the crowd, from the other runners, and, and somehow I was able to, to turn uh, the, the tides on the race and, and finish greatly for the picture. Uh, and, <laughs> and and it is a fantastic feeling. Uh, and, but although after all this effort and uh, crossing the, the, the finishing line after 42 kilometers uh, of running, looking at my watch and saying, oh, just 55 seconds. Uh, but, and so uh, half an hour later, as I'm just drinking this cold, deserved beer, uh, I've started thinking about some questions. Why was it when I knew that I had just had to run at that speed, why wasn't my body able to do so? Even though later, it, my body was really able to run at that speed. So what exactly happened at this moment? So what, what, what does it mean to eat the wall? And the answer is fatigue, right? It's, it's, a, it's an obvious answer. The wall is basically is a metaphor for fatigue. And one of the definitions of fatigue is the following. It's the failure to maintain the required force, velocity, or power that occurs at the point called task failure or point of fatigue. Um, and, and so this is our textbook definition. And, and this is something that not only amateur uh, runners uh, as me uh, have to deal with, but even professional and elite runners. So I'd like to tell you a story and that story is about uh, the Beijing Olympics 10 kilometers final, uh, male final, that was won by Ethiopian athlete Bakele here in the picture. So uh, there were seven uh, athletes competing on this race, and it's a 10 kilometer race, it's shorter than, than a marathon, but it's also considered endurance running. Uh, and and uh, I'm gonna show you the speed profiles of all the athletes in the race, each one with a line, and this is the beginning, the first five kilometers of the race, the, the one uh, with the thick line is the, the speed profile of, the, of Bakele, who would eventually win the race. And you can see until uh, kilometer five, all of them are very close to each other. They're all keeping their opponents within distance. But then something starts happening, and, and around like kilometer six, we start seeing some lines dropping off. So these two athletes, that uh, their speeds were not able to match the speed of the remaining uh, athletes, they're now basically out of the race. Because with each step, the distance between them and the leading pack is just increasing. And if we continue watching the development of the race, we're gonna see that in the, over the next kilometers, there's three other lines that start dropping. And eventually, in the final uh, sprints, there's one line. So when Bakela just blazed through the track and left his only opponent at this moment uh, meters away, to eventually win old in the Olympic. So 
the, the fatigue here, or the wall here, is not failing to run at a constant speed, but it's failing to run at the speed where you're basically uh, within distance of the leader, right? Uh, but still, the problem is fatigue. Why was it that the athletes here uh, started uh, running slower and slower? It was not that they cannot run at this speed because they had done it faster uh, before, but, some, but the, the, somehow they were not able to sustain the speed. So in endurance running, the winner is not the one that is able to run the fastest, but is the one that is able to run at the fast speed for longer. The one is able to maintain this faster speed. And, and, and so the question that we're trying to address is what exactly is it that causes fatigue? So stop a little bit and try to think about this question. What is it that you think that, why was it that this athlete stopped? Why was it that I, at kilometer 32, just start uh, running slower and slower? Um, and I probably most of you are thinking something like, well, of course it's the muscles, right? You are running, your legs have muscles. Muscles are what's making you run. And with time, muscles get exhausted. You get tired. And this muscle exhaustion ultimately is what is going to lead to uh, fatigue, which in this case corresponds to task failure, the failure to run at your pace, the failure to keep up with the winner. Uh, also on parallel, um, the muscle exhaustion is also what gives you this perception of effort. You feel that you're making a lot of effort because your muscles are working a lot. And so this has been the traditional view of sports uh, physiology. Uh, and, um, and, and, and so I would like to continue uh, going into this question a little bit deeper. And OK, what exactly is muscle exhaustion? Why do muscles uh, get tired, right? Uh, and I mean, I, this is not going to be uh, a talk about uh, physiology, but very simplistically, you can think of the muscles as the engines that are making you uh, run, right? And, and they need energy, and that energy can come in many different sources. And th there are several nutrients that are uh, required for someone to run. Uh, among them, the muscular reserves of glycogen, uh, oxygen, and also glucose, fatty acids, and proteins can be used as energy for muscles. And while the muscles are working and producing energy, they're also producing byproducts. Uh, and these byproducts can be lactic acid, uh, CO2, and also hydrogen ions. So what, what people think about uh, muscle exhaustion is this depletion of the uh, nutrients and this accumulation uh, of byproducts that basically uh, causes muscle uh, soreness and, and, and this feeling of, of pain in your muscles. And that, w that eventually is what leads uh, to fatigue. And while the muscles are depleting their nutrients and accumulating their byproducts, also their ability to produce work, to produce energy, uh, starts uh, decreasing. So this could be seen with the following uh, analysis. So imagine that you have a task in this case, running at a constant speed. Uh, so the amount of power or energy that you need to do uh, as a function of time is going to be constant. Uh, when you start, your muscles are fresh. So the amount of power that they can produce is higher than what you require them to do. Uh, so this, is, this line here is the required uh, power for the task. And the line here is going to be the maximum power that your muscles are able to produce. Now, as time goes on and your muscles are working, their power uh, that they can produce starts decreasing, exactly because they're accumulating these byproducts and using uh, energy. And eventually, there's a moment where they can no longer produce the power required for the test that you're doing. And this exactly is what defines the point of fatigue. So this has been the traditional view uh, in sports physiology. Uh, and recently, scientists uh, decided to study it in the lab. Um, and uh, the way they did so was using stationary bikes that you're probably familiar to. Uh, and, and, and they asked athletes to come to the lab and to um, pedal at a constant power for uh, as long as they could until they eventually reach fatigue. So in this case, the power uh, as a function of time in this task would be constant. 
But then right after they reach fatigue, they would tell the athletes, now cycle as hard as you can for just a few seconds. Give as much as you can. And according to this model, the muscles are depleted. So the, the, the most that they can do is at least what they were doing just a moment before. So this would be uh, the observed result. Now, if you had asked the same athletes just before they were doing this constant exercise task, they would be able to produce much more power. And the power output would be somewhere here. And then if you interrupted the constant power uh, exercise at different uh, time points, you would get intermediate results. So this would be the, what the, the classical model would uh, have predicted. And now let's look at what the scientists actually observed. So they asked the athletes to come to the lab and they cycled uh, on these bikes uh, at 240 uh, watts. Uh, and then they interrupted at different time points in different days and they asked them, now pedal as hard as you can for a few seconds. And just prior to the test, they would be able to produce a power higher than 1,000 watts. Now, as they would be interrupted in later in the constant exercise, uh, the amount of power that they were able to produce would be uh, lower, just as the model uh, had predicted. And you can see here the line at different time points is lower. But surprisingly, the scientists find out, found out that even after the athletes fatigue, reached the point of fatigue, when they said, I can no longer sustain these 240 watts, uh, I, 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 my legs literally can. And, and now they were motivated to, you have to cycle as hard as you can for just a few seconds. They were able to do it at a power that was three times higher than what they were doing before. So what is happening here? How can we explain uh, this difference? There's, there has to be something wrong uh, with this traditional view. So wh what this experiment has shown is that even at the point of fatigue, muscles still have energy, still have enough power to do the tasks that they were required to do. So now we go back to uh, our model. And, and because we have seen it uh, this way, we have to say, OK, muscle exhaustion maybe is not playing a role here. And, and because the muscles still could perform, uh, uh, but the athletes weren't able to, probably there was a choice not to perform. And so task failure, fatigue that before was defined as task failure, now is defined as task disengagement. Now there's a choice to stop doing the task. It's not that I cannot do the task anymore, but there is somehow the brain is choosing that I no longer want to do this task. And this choice to give up on the task is balanced uh, between the perception of effort and the motivation of the athlete. Um, and, and this is the, a, a psychobiological view uh, of um, uh, sports exercise where now we no longer have muscle exhaustion leading directly to fatigue, but we have this balance between the perception of effort that the, ath the ath athlete is doing together with how motivated he is that leads to this test disengagement. Now, of course, muscle exhaustion is not out of the picture. I'm not saying that muscles are not important to cycle or to run, because of course they are. But what they do is they contribute to the perception of effort. And in fact, what the brain is doing is tracking the amount of effort, uh, which can be seen as the amount of stress that you're putting in the body. Uh, and it has a, a, a very safe margin that will eventually disengage on the task when it sees that you're risking the well-being uh, of the body. Because if, if this was not so, if you really went until your actual physical limit, you could permanently damage your muscles and you could, ev it could even put yourself in a lethal uh, situation. So muscle exhaustion is uh, making you perceive that you're working hard, and then this perception of working hard, together with the motivation that you have on the task, is what causes you to stop doing what you're doing. Of course, this is all done subconsciously. You are not aware of it. For you, the runner stops because he thinks that the body cannot continue running at that speed. It's not because he thinks that I'm going to stop running at, that, at this speed because this is not worth it. No, like runners are crazy. Like running, getting your goal in the race, that's the only thing that matters or 
maybe not that, but a thing that matters a lot. So they don't stop because they're trying to safeguard their bodies. They stop it because actually the, the brain is doing it without them being aware of so. So this is very interesting uh, because we, don't, we lost this direct connection. And now um, what scientists have also been looking at is whether it is possible to change this perception of effort without changing uh, muscle exhaustion. Because muscle exhaustion is caused by actually running uh, or uh, cycling or doing the exercise that you're doing. But if there's a way to change how we perceive the effort that we're doing without affecting it, it could be uh, very useful. And so recently, there's a lot of evidence uh, that has shown that, for example, mental fatigue also plays a critical role in our perception of effort. For example, there were experiments that showed that when subjects were shown uh, non-conscious uh, visual cues associated with positive things or bad things, this also uh, changed how they um, perceive their effort. And there's many other factors, such as temperature, time and distance feedback, caffeine consumption, self-talk, and so on. And all of this can affect perception of effort without affecting muscle uh, exhaustion. So again, this is the main message is, while it's true that muscle exhaustions, of course, affect perception of effort, therefore affecting fatigue, there are other things that also do it without affecting uh, muscle exhaustion. And one of those things is mental fatigue. So uh, I'm sure that you've all experienced this, like working a lot or maybe uh, staying out a night dancing, and then on the other day, you're, uh, you feel really tired. And it's not just tired like I need to sleep, but it's also physically tired. And everything costs. There's a lot of effort in all the tasks that you do. Uh, so there's this idea. And again, scientists went to study this uh, in the lab. So they did a, a similar experiment to the one that I described before, uh, where they had the cyclists uh, working on these stationary uh, bicycles and, and producing uh, constant uh, power. And, and now what they did was, before the exercise, they had a group of athletes uh, do a visual discrimination test. It's kind of like playing a, a video game where you need to be mentally focused for, for some time. And then there was another control group where they asked the athletes to just watch a neutral documentary. So now we have these two different groups of athletes, and now let's see uh, how they perform in this uh, constant power task. So as they start pedaling, already before they actually pedaled, so here I'm going to show you two lines, one with these white circles and the other one with the black circles. The white circles are the ones that were shown the documentary, and the black circles are the ones that had to do uh, the visual discrimination test. And just even before uh, starting to cycle, the group that had done the visual discrimination test reported higher values of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, perceived exertion, which means that they felt that they were more tired than the other group. Now, as they continue doing the test, this difference maintained, and eventually, the group that was mentally fatigued, the group that had to do the visual discrimination test before the physical exercise, they reached fatigue around two minutes before than the other group. And this is a big uh, difference in terms of proportion. So this clearly shows that uh, Mental fatigue, just doing a visual discrimination test that has nothing to do with your muscles, can cause you to perceive that you're more tired and cause you to reach fatigue earlier. And they also did a, a few uh, physiological measurements to try to determine the level of muscle exhaustion in these two groups. And of course, they were the same because they had done uh, the same exercise. It was not that ones uh, worked harder than the others, but it was their perception of the effort that they were putting it that was different. So we go back to our model, and we've been focusing on this perception of effort part. But as you can see, there's also the motivation uh, that plays a key role together with the perception of effort in determining the point of fatigue. So focusing uh, on this part, I want to do an exercise with you. Uh, so I hope that you've seen uh, this position before. This is called uh, a squat. Uh, and uh, people do this in gyms, and some people try to do this as long as they can. Uh, and, and so I would like you to, I don't know if you've tried, but uh, try to think of how long you would be able to stay in this position. 
So who thinks that they would be able to do this for over one minute? Please raise your hands. Okay. What about two minutes? Three? There's still quite a few. Four? Okay. Well, either we have a very fit audience or you're definitely overestimating your physical abilities. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I'm not going to ask you to do this for four minutes, but if you please get up, and I'm serious about this. So, of course, only once, right? I'm not forcing you. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to exemplify. I'm going to put on this position. Uh, and, and, and then there's going to be a timer for one minute so that you have a feeling of uh, how much this costs. OK, so let me put in position. OK, so off we go. OK, so I bet this was not what you were expecting doing <laughs> when you came here today. So how are you feeling? Still, still early? Oh, I see some legs shaking. <laughs> Try to do it. It's, it's, it's 90 degrees, not 10 degrees, Danielle. Uh, OK. Um, just, just bear a little bit longer. We're halfway through. So now, those of you who said four minutes, what are you thinking? <laughs> OK, that's cool. So if, if those that can last until the end, you can skip leg day this week at the gym, OK? <laughs> OK, we're getting there. Doesn't cost that much. We're almost there. Uh, OK. Great. Great. We deserve. So, so does anyone still say that there can last more than four minutes? Uh, and, and what about, uh, now, now think about this question. So um, what if I offered you money to do this? <laughs> what if uh, for each minute that you were uh, staying in this position, I gave you a few uh, euros. Do you think that you would be able to last longer? So, so on, on, a, on a classical experiment done more than uh, 30 years ago, uh, a researcher went on to study exactly this. So we had uh, subjects in the lab uh, doing uh, a similar position. It was not this was a wall squat, so it was easier. Um, and, and this was in France in 86, so they had the French franc, but I have already converted this to euros, so it's easier for you to follow. So uh, when he gave 10 cents of a euro uh, per minute, um, subjects were able to, uh, on average, uh, last longer than uh, two minutes. Um, it's not much, maybe in, in 86 probably it was uh, represented much more than today. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, or not, uh, when he gave more money, uh, for example, when he doubled the amount of money to uh, 20 cents, uh, subjects were now able to last more than three minutes. And that continued for until like five uh, and a half euros, where subjects were uh, doing it for uh, five minutes. So the, the, the interesting part about this is not that like subjects gave up because they felt like I'm not being paid enough, I'm <laughs> giving up now. Uh, when they gave up, they really felt that they had reached their point of fatigue. Uh, it didn't cross their mind that if they were being offered more money, they would be able to last longer. Uh, and, and, and this is the interesting part. So it's, it's a process, a motivation is playing a role uh, in a way that the subjects are not aware, okay? And, and the way that they value money, uh, motivation here should be seen as the monetary rewards, usually motivation for most people. Um, uh, motivation, uh, they, they don't see it that way. It's, it's, it's something that is happening without them being uh, aware. 
Uh, and, and so um, I hope that today, like through these different stories and some signs that I've shared with you, uh, you've, you've learned a few concepts. And one of them is that the wall, this thing that we runners define as this mythical creature that we face at 31, 32 kilometers in the marathon, um, is a limit. And it, here it, it somehow is a metaphor for fatigue. This is a point where a lot of athletes reach fatigue because they're usually not used to running that distance, they don't place themselves correctly, and they run out of energy, let's say it that way. Now, for uh, an athlete, uh, the wall is something very real. Uh, and as I said in my example, on that moment, I really felt that I could not run faster than I was running. Um, still, we've just seen that there are other things that affect this feeling of fatigue, and motivation is a very important one. And so I hope that you've realized that the wall is actually not that physical, but it's more of a mental uh, limit. Although I, I'm not saying that muscles are not playing a role here. There definitely are, but the limit, the wall, is a mental one, uh, more than a, a physical one. And maybe uh, you don't relate to this example, maybe you don't run, but I'm sure that uh, most of you have dealt with limits in your life. Uh, maybe uh, a writer's block, or a, a deadline approaching, or a very uh, ambitious uh, goal uh, that you're pretty sure that you'll not be able to succeed. And we put these limits in our mind, and we perceive them as being real, as being physical, while in fact they may not be. And so I hope that with this example, you can see that uh, sometimes when you face the limit, a little bit of motivation is all it takes to get you from here to here. So thank you very much for your attention. So there's going to be an opportunity for questions uh, for uh, both the talks of the evening, but, they're going to, but there's going to be a moment for it, and that's during the roundtable discussion. So I would ask you to please save your questions for that. And uh, we're going to hear now uh, from Nunu, uh, who has a very interesting story also to share with you. But before that, I would again uh, like to thank the Volvo Ocean Race for another amazing video that they've uh, uh, done to that kind of shows some of the life uh, aspects of a sailors during the race. Not normal. Gary, felt we had the most through. Iceberg on the path. Once when I get some blood in the cup.
So, hi everyone, good evening. I hope you have recovered from that one minute squat that Tiago made you do. Um, so Tiago indeed introduced you the limits or physical limits, but I guess we all know that many times, even though we are c perfectly capable of doing a physical action, because of the context that we're put in, that physical action is not gonna be at our peak performance. Imagine, for example, speaking in public. I'm perfectly capable of speaking, of producing sounds with my vocal cords. However, you put me in front of 500 people, and these words are not coming as well as I wanted. Probably I'm gonna forget most of them. So, hopefully you can, forget, you can forgive me if this performance doesn't go as planned, but what I want to tell you today about is exactly this. Is how changing the context that you're put under, or that you're putting in, um, how that can also affect your performance. How can you deal with that? And why does that happen? And so, before I start, somehow, ah, okay. So, before I start, I'd like to tell you a short story. So, I'd like you to imagine that you're an astronaut, and you've been training for years to go up in space. Finally, you've been selected. You've been sent up to space to the International Space Station, where you've been living for more than one month. I guess everyone here knows how harsh the situation in space is. So you don't have gravity, you are forced, let's say, to live in a confined and isolated environment with another six crew members. You don't have any privacy. The food, well, that really sucks. And then, I guess, you have all these demanding situations. You're an astronaut, after all, and so you're expected to deliver as much as you can every single day, 24 seven. And so, on top of this, because you've been asked to go to the ISS, but the International Space Station, but now they also ask you that today, for some reason, there is a blurry camera outside of the walls of the International Space Station that needs to be fixed. And so on top of all this that I just told you, of all these stressful situations, now you have to go outside and fix that bloody camera. All right, so you start getting ready for it. What do you do? You don don your suit. And you know this is the only thing that is gonna be protecting you from the adversities outside. No air, no pressure, deadly temperatures. On top of that, of course, you wanna make sure that this cable is working properly. In fact, this is the only thing that is gonna be protecting you from floating away. While you do this, you cannot avoid thinking. If I do float away, there is nothing nor anyone that can save me. The only thing that is left is a couple of hours of oxygen inside my suit, and uh, for sure I will be suffocating to death in a couple of hours. So this is clearly a thought that you don't wanna, that you don't wanna think about, and so you erase that from your mind. Also you're ready now, and your colleague going with you is ready, so you're, going to, you're ready to go, both of you outside. So off you go. You open the doors of the International Space Station, you look outside to this beautiful scenery, and you try to take that first step outside, but you hesitate. Of course, you're going to the void of space. You're going to this constant darkness. How could you not? But slowly, you build up that courage, that strength, and you take that first step. And you start slowly going to that faulty camera to fix it just as planned. However, suddenly, ground control calls you. There's a problem. Your cable is torn. You'll need to, to, re to replace it. Um, just keep us plan and uh, hold, hold on tight to the ISS. And that's what you do, you just hold on tight. Suddenly a million thoughts are coming to your mind. One of them is the, mean, the image of you just floating away in space. But you cannot, you cannot keep on this. And so you just hold on tight to see your colleague going there, fetching the cable, coming back, and he helps you out, replacing that cable, and everything is fine now. Okay, so that, the, that did trigger some weird feelings in your body, your uh, heart started pumping, and you needed to deal with it. However, you went back inside, you actually finished the whole mission, and only after that, after a couple of hours, you went back inside, and you made sure that everything was okay. So this is indeed a story, but this story is actually real, and it happened just last week on board of the International Space Station to astronaut Joe Acaba. To be fair, he didn't just have that cable. He also had a security jetpack to uh, propel him back to the station. However, in the exact same spacewalk, that security jetpack failed as well. And so, I guess this tells you how 
extreme and limit these situations are, the astronauts have to deal with. And what I would like to ask you is, how did you feel when you heard this story? You probably felt some uncomfortable feelings. Probably you thought, what would I have done? Would I have continued that mission? Would I have wanted to go inside right away? Well, we know that astronauts have to cope with these situations. And we also know that probably they are affected in different ways than we, than we are. But so what I want to tell you today is exactly this, is how the context is going to change your performance. It's going to change your behavior. And in order to do that, I would like to show, I would like to explain you what stress in these limiting situations is it can be defined as. And so we can define stress as a physiological and adaptive response to any stimulus that is perceived as a threatening or demanding. And we've heard this word stress many, many times over. And usually we associate it with a bad feeling and bad for your body. But is that actually always the case? Well, I guess another way of asking this question is, why do we feel stress? And I think one way of answering can be in an evolutionary way. Think, for example, that you're this zebra in the middle of the savanna. And suddenly you see a lion is running just towards you. And you know, the only way that you can save your neck is outrun that lion. What do you need to do? You need to activate those muscles as fast and efficiently as possible. And if we go back to Tiago's talk, what do we need? We need those, that oxygen and those nutrients. In order to, to do that, our body knows what to do. Let's increase our breathing rate. Let's, let's increase our heart rate. Our blood pressure is going to go up. At the same time, because this is an extreme situation, we don't want to think about anything else. So let's shut down our digestive system. Let's shut down our immune system. And let's uh, sexual arousal, let's forget that. We don't really need that right now, do we? OK. So in this situation, clearly, which we define as an acute stress situation or reaction, we, we clearly depend on this uh, response of our body in order to save our neck, or in this case, the zebra depends on it. But I think we can relate to this as well. For example, the sailors here in front, they face many times situations where very quickly the context changes and they have to act in a different way. They have to act fast and efficiently. But we all do these things as well. We all feel it on a, daily day, on a daily basis. Imagine that you're crossing the street. There's a car coming at you. You want to jump towards the sidewalk so that you're not hit by that car. And so stress is indeed good in some of the situations. But if we keep having this stress and building it up, adding it up every single day, if we have a, a stressful situation that goes on with, uh, a long time, with many, many days, well, we're going to be forced to deal with that, and that can trigger different reactions in our body that can indeed be detrimental for our health. And in those cases, we can end up in a situation that is called chronic stress. And so this puts a bit in context the word stress. And what I, I tried to tell you just now is that different levels of stress can trigger different reactions and uh, lead to different performances. But so. How can we test this? How can we be sure that that is the case? Well, we can go back more than 100 years and see what some scientists tried to do in 1908. So in this famous experiment, Yerkes and Dodson actually took some mice in, and put them in a labyrinth. They forced these mice at a certain point to choose whether they wanted to go through a, right, through a white box or a gray box. And the task was simple. If they chose the white box, they would go through the box, nothing would happen, back to the beginning of the labyrinth. However, if they chose the gray box, before they were allowed to pass all the way through the box, they would get a mild shock in their foot. And so ideally, what the mice should understand is that white is good and black, or gray in this case, is bad. OK, so what did scientists see? Well, they saw indeed that if you increase the level of stressor, in this case, the shock intensity, the mouse would start performing better. What does that mean? They would be uh, faster distinguishing that the white was good and the gray was bad. And I think we can relate to this, because if imagine that the shock was not even, they could almost not feel the shock. Well, their performance then would not change too much. They wouldn't know which one to choose. Both of them would be the same. As soon as it starts increasing, they are for sure going to want to decide whether to uh, want to decide to go to the white one instead of the gray. However, they only saw this up to a certain point. As soon as the stress uh, passed a certain threshold, 
what I saw was a decrease in performance. Now, mice were taking much, much longer to distinguish between these two boxes. And so, I think we can try to relate to this curve. This was, as I said, proved or uh, found out more than 100 years ago. And in this last 100 years, it has been proven over and over again in different situations, in animal models and humans alike. Let's say, for example, that you're a student and you're taking several courses. And so, if one of the courses does not have any tests, any exams, probably the intensity of the stress is so low that you're going to be falling into this side of this curve. You're going to be bored. You're not going to be motivated enough to start studying and, uh, and perform well at that specific course. However, you set a certain deadline for a specific test. You're now motivated. You now can perform at your top level in that, in that same exam. But now let's assume that you have two, three tests, five tests in that same week. Then the stressor starts being too high. And uh, you're, it's going to generate some sense of anxiety. You don't know what to start studying before. And so you're going to have uh, an impaired performance. And if you increase this stressor too much, you're probably going to generate some health problems. And uh, you're going to enter here on the panic area. And so as I said, I think we can all relate to this in our daily jobs or uh, our daily life. But is it always true that the same intensity of stress generates the same, uh, the same level of performance? Well, not exactly, right? Let's think that you have now a task that is perceived to be much, much harder. Let's say for the example of the same student, now he has exactly the same deadline. So intensity of stress is time to exam. He has exactly the same deadline. But for a course that now he thinks is much, much more difficult to study. Well, in this case, what happens is that in st because of the stress is exactly the same, now it falls on this part of the curve. And so it's going to be probably, he's going to feel some anxiety. And again, he's going to probably have some uh, performance issues in that test. The same applies inversely, right? So if I have now a course that is much easier than what before was causing some impairment in my performance. Now it's actually motivating me to study more, and I will be performing, e performing better than, than I would for the other course in the same exact conditions. This is even more so if we consider, for example, a task that is super easy for us to do. Let's say doing the dishes. It doesn't matter what el whatever is going on around me. I can do the dishes as easily as if I have nothing, no one else around me. I guess I need some motivation to to pump up this, uh, this curve, but after that, everything is the same. In fact, this is also what Yerkes and Dodson saw. For example, if the boxes, instead of being white and gray, now they were white and black, super easy to distinguish. The, the higher the level of this uh, intensi the stressor, so the intensity of the shock, the better the performance of the mice. And so with this, I'm trying to tell you that stress can actually be beneficial for you, and different levels of stress actually affect your performance in different ways. But also, as I mentioned, uh, a stress that occurs for a very long time can have different consequences. And one of them that, we, that scientists wanted to test is whether that can actually affect your behavior. And in order to introduce this, I would like to introduce two different terms that probably you've heard before, but if you haven't, I will try to explain them quite easily. So goal-directed and habitual behavior. What does this mean? Let's give an example. So let's say that you live on the other side of the river. And every single day, you have to drive to Champalimau. You, have, you work here, you have to drive here. What do you do? Well, it's 9 AM. You enter the car, you buckle your seatbelt, and start, you start driving. You just do this out of habit. It's a repetitive behavior. You don't even have to think about it. If I ask you how many times did you stop in a red traffic light, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to tell me because you do this in a repetitive manner. And to this, we call an habitual behavior. However, if I tell you that tomorrow, Tiago is going to be running on the Pont Vincent de Bril, I think he's not there. I think it was during his pee break. But um, if uh, Tiago is running on this Pont Vincent de Bril, what you want to do if you're on the other side of the river, is think beforehand that you're not going to be able to cross this bridge driving, right? 
And so probably before going there, you want to decide that you want to take the ferry. OK, fair enough. The thing is, if you're behaving in an habitual matter, what is going to happen is that you're going to go inside your car. You're going to buckle that seat belt. You're going to drive to the bridge. However, you get to the bridge, it's blocked. There's all these people running this marathon. Well, in that case, you're going to have to turn back, face traffic, and it's going to be a mess. So you want to behave in a goal-directed method. You want to be able to change your behavior when the context where you're put in is changing as well. And this is important for limit situations because many times we are facing very different situations from the ones that we're used to. Sailors, for example, they face these situations on a daily basis and they need to be able to act differently according to the different context they are set in. And so what scientists wanted to see is does stress change your behavior? Does it make you more habitual? Would you continue driving to the bridge even though you shouldn't and you know you shouldn't? Well, we cannot just stop the bridge every other day and uh, measure whether people are going there or not or taking the ferry, but we can do this in the lab. And uh, in Braga, what uh, some clever scientists did was taking some medical students that were under stress. What does it mean? Well, basically, they took a, a group of students that had been studied for one year for this final medical exam that is going to dictate whether they're going to be able to choose the speciality they want or they're going to be family doctors. That's basically how it's going to be. And um, I can tell you this, my sister is now super stressed. She's taking the exam next week. And I can assure you that she's falling in this, uh, in this, um, in this situation here. And so they, they took this group of students and then a group of students that were completely fine, relaxed, and uh, they reported the same. They reported they were super relaxed. And how, how did they test this? Well, they took some chocolate milk. They asked all the students to fast, so not eat for 12 hours straight, and come to the lab super hungry. And then they asked if they all liked chocolate milk. The answer was always yes. OK, so if you like chocolate milk, I'm going to give you a task that you only have two buttons. If you press button number one, even though you don't know a priori, you don't know beforehand, but if you press button number one, there's going to be a probability that you're going to get that chocolate milk. If you press button number two, that is not going to happen. There's no chocolate milk for you. And so what do they expect? Students are going to press more times this button number one because they are hungry and they like chocolate milk. And now comes the clever part of this experiment. In the middle of the experiment, they take these students out of the lab and they give them as much chocolate milk as they can, as they can drink. They get so fed up of chocolate milk, they cannot see it anymore. What we say is that this chocolate milk has been devalued. So before, they valued that chocolate milk a lot. They actually were hungry. They needed to drink it. Now they devalued it. They don't want it anymore. And ideally, they wouldn't press for it because they just cannot take it. If they actually get it, they need to drink it. So what did they see? Well, first, for the control group, they saw that the milk, when it was valued, when they actually wanted that milk, they were pressing a lot for it. And they were getting that milk a lot of times. As soon as they got, all that, they got fed all that milk, they never wanted to, or they very seldom wanted to, to get it again. Then for the stress group, this was the interesting part. Again, they saw that they pressed it a lot for it in the beginning. They were hungry. But now, they shouldn't press for it anymore. They don't want it, but they still press for that chocolate milk. Why is this? Well, they are, they are behaving in this habitual method that I told you before. Take the example again of the car. They would be driving to the bridge just to find out that it was blocked, and they knew it, and they have to go back and wait in traffic for a couple of hours. Even more interesting, they then asked the exact same students one month after that exam. Now they were super relaxed. They had one month of holidays. And they saw exactly this when they asked to, for them to report their stress level. And they saw that now they were indeed devaluing that chocolate milk. It, they didn't want that chocolate milk anymore when they were put into the same context. So what does this, this tell us? It tells us that if you're under stress, and the chronic stress for a very long time, this is going to affect your behavior. And it's going to make it more habitual. So you're going to have a more repetitive behavior than you're supposed to have. Why is this important? Imagine again that you're in, a, in an extreme situation. You're a sailor. You're a sailor, and for many, many days, you've been working in confinement with these other crew members. And there's just 
way too much pressure and the, uh, way too much demand for your resources. Well, probably you're going to be affected by chronic stress. And probably your actions are going to be, you're going to become much more habitual. And this is dangerous because in a stressful situation where you have to react fast, you're going to be used to react in a certain way. And if you react in the same way always, even though the context changes, that can cause some problems. OK, so this was done in humans. And basically, in our lab, we are very interested in this as well, to, to understand what is going on in the brain when you're under these stressful situations, when, when you behave in, under this habitual matter. And so we wanted to look at this triatum. Triatum is a part of the brain that is usually associated with action selection. So your ability to uh, change between this goal-directed and habitual behavior, let's say. This is the part of the human brain. This is the rat brain. This is the striatum in both of the, in both of the brains. And so we tested this with rats, or in fact, Eduardo tested this in rats, because not only you can see their behavior, but you can probe their brains after or during that experiment. And this helps us understand what is going on in the brain while you're behaving in a certain matter. And so what the Eduardo looked at was this dendrite's length. Dendrites are the arms of neurons that are actually receiving the inputs from other neurons. You probably know that the brain is full of neurons and, in, and the speaks, or these neurons speak to each other via chemical and electrical signals. And so these dendrites are the, the arms that are receiving those signals. And in this striatum, we can actually differentiate two different zones. One is the dorsal medium striatum, which we know that is usually associated with goal-directed behavior. The other one is the dorsal lateral striatum that is more associated with habitual behavior. And what did, they saw? what did they see? Well, they saw that actually on the part that was associated with goal-directed, the, the stress group had a, a, a dorsal medium striatum that was uh, shrunk in comparison to the other one. And inversely, the dorsal lateral striatum, more related to habitual, actually increased, increased their size. If you, for example, take a look at the neurons now, you can see exactly the same. So this is a typical control neuron, like of a, a normal mouse. And this is the neurons of a stressed mouse under the under stress situation and on the DMS, on the dorsal uh, medium striatum. So you see that these uh, arbors, these uh, arms, are actually decreased. And inversely, on this case, you see that they increase a lot. And so we know that the behavior changes and the physiology, the brain changes as well. So I've told you about stress. Uh, I've told you what, how different uh, situations can, can change the performance, how stress can affect the performance in different ways. I've told you some physio physio physiological changes and behavior changes under chronic stress. But now the question remains. So how do we prevent or deal with stressful situations in extreme missions? Going back to these astronauts, we know that they are under chronic stress, but many times there is an acute stress situation like the one that I described, where, where they have to behave properly, they have to behave efficiently. The same with sailors, the same with all of us. If we are under a very tough period of our lives, in, a, in school or work. Well, we know there are some things we cannot change. For example, in these extreme situations, for astronauts, for sailors, if we're going for two years to Mars, there's going to be isolation and confinement. We will not be able to change this. If we're sailing for nine months in the sea, well, there's going to be some tough physical condition, and we cannot change this. We're going to have some irregular work shifts. Probably these sailors here in front of you, they cannot sleep more than four hours at a time. This is going to cause some troubles to him, and we cannot change that. So what can we do? Well, there are some things we can change. First of all, we can change the way that we select the crews. And this is what space agencies have done for a very long time. They test the subjects, or they test the, the, the astronauts over and over again. They put them in a lot of different contexts and see how they react. And in the end, they try taking the best ones. It's always difficult to predict what are the best ones, because most of the unexpected situations are exactly that, unexpected. So you don't know how they are going to react, because you cannot prepare for them. But you can have an idea of how these people can cope with these situations. You can also provide some emotional support. Again, space agencies have been doing this 
over and over again for the last couple of decades. For example, astronauts that have, been on, uh, that have been in space for a very long time, every now and then they get visited by other astronauts. And these other astronauts, they bring some presents, they br bring some gifts. Some of these gifts are just fresh fruits. As I said, food on space station is not amazing. So these fresh fruits are really valuable. But not only this, they allow them to Skype with their family or at least send some video messages. They, they allow them to uh, play with each other during the mission so that they can bond more and they can strengthen that bond while they are uh, during that specific mission. And finally, one thing you can actually do is train. And you train some more. And you train in a, a lot of different contexts, in a lot of different situations. And you prepare for everything that you can think about. I guess that's what these sailors do. I guess that's what the astronauts do. And I guess that's what we all do for different situations of our life. And so just to finish with, I, I guess this training is going to help you shifting this curve to the right. It's actually going to try to make it easier for you if the same stressor now is in this state, instead of being uh, triggering an anxiety uh, situation is now helping you and motivating you to perform better. And so to finish with, I, I'd like just to, to tell you a little story. So basically two years ago, me and another five crew members, we spent two weeks in the middle of the Utah desert in the US. And we lived in this very small habitat, uh, simulating a Mars space mission. So the exact same conditions that we would find on Mars. If, they, if you wanted to go outside, you'd have to wait five minutes in a depressurization chamber in order to, uh, to, co to, go out, to be allowed to go out. We didn't have any communications with the external world, for example, or at least we had, it to, wait, we had to wait for 40 minutes to get the response. But the main objective of this mission was actually to test and develop some protocols for emergency procedures something that astronauts can then train over and over again in order to prevent uh, bad things from happening when they are on Mars and that situation actually happens. Our idea is that if they train all these protocols that we have developed, they can actually shift that curve to the right and it can make them be much more resilient to that kind of uh, context that they are in. They at least can, they have an idea of how to behave. But I guess it doesn't apply just to these limit situations if we're going to other, uh, other planets or sailing here in the sea. And so I guess my take home message is for each one of you to go out there, train, experience as much as you can. Put yourself in difficult but controllable situations because that is going to shift your curve also to the right. And that is going to make you perform much better in new and in unexpected situations. So thank you. And I guess now, before we go to the round table, there is one last video of uh, Volvo Charais that uh, they have gifted us with these three amazing videos, so let's just watch it. Thanks. Not normal people. Iceberg on the path. How can I describe life on board? Well, it's kind of like living in a house that moves. Compact living arrangements, some shared living spaces. The kitchen is cozy, but the views are magnificent. The neighbors are friendly too. There are downsides, a small problem with damp. The bedroom is basic and it can be a little noisy. The bathroom can be challenging. The killer feature is the swimming pool. It's really spacious. Okay, so it's not an ordinary home. It isn't an ordinary office. Does your home do this? Does your office do this? But life still goes on and work goes on, all in the pursuit of this. 
racing around the clock for weeks at a time. That's weeks eating this, sleeping like this, dreaming of this, looking like this, and surviving this. It's not an ordinary life. And maybe the people living it aren't ordinary people. But this is life lived to the full. It's life lived at the extreme. So it, it does look tough, but a lot of fun, I guess. Uh, I just have to apologize because, as I said, because of the context, my performance was going to be a bit worse than I was expecting, and I didn't introduce myself. So I'm actually a, a PhD student here at the Champalimont Champal Research as well. And, but before coming here, my interest or my background was in aerospace and physics engineering. And uh, yeah, as you saw, like I've been doing a lot of stuff related to aerospace and I'm very interested in space exploration, these limits that astronauts have pushed to, especially now that we're talking seriously about going to Mars in this two-year round trip. So yeah, I guess I, I owned you that, so uh, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, so now we have, I guess, what you guys all have been expect, uh, uh, waiting for. And um, we want to invite these amazing people to the, to the stage. We want to start by Filippa, um, and uh, please come on stage. I guess a round of applause for her. So I will not introduce all these people because I will let them do it. Uh, I think, just take a seat. I guess uh, you want to stay there? I can see you. Yeah, just take a seat. Can <laughs> sit down? OK. So. Is this working? OK, so now I uh, would like to call all the members uh, of the Volvo Ocean Race who are going to be uh, sharing their experience here uh, tonight. So first, uh, Damien uh, Foxall. Could you please come on the stage? And applause, applause. Thank you. Have a seat, Damien. Dee Caffery, is, is that correct? The Caffery, OK. Antonio Fonch, I hope I didn't miss that uh, pronunciation. <laughs> Nick Weiss. Uh, and the CEO of uh, Volvo Ocean Race, uh, Mike, Turn uh, Mike Turner. I can see that. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we, we can give you the closest chair if you want. Like, uh, exactly there. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so right. you, there, there's some uh, mics here. So I guess you, you're going to be sharing them. Let's see if uh, I can turn this, this on. One. There you go. Um, so maybe uh, if you just could very briefly just uh, again uh, say your name and what you do uh, uh, right now and why you think you're here. Uh, and then <laughs> well, you're, you're going to have more opportunity to uh, tell uh, everyone about your stories uh, as uh, questions uh, start being uh, asked. Just, just one thing before. So we are actually going to be looking at our phones because you can actually send all the questions to these contacts, and we can ask them. So this is, like, I, I guess, the best way for us to interact with you. Just send the questions, and we're going to be asking that to the panel. Yeah, okay? so either by the, this phone number or email uh, or the chats on our uh, online streaming for those uh, following us online. That's not fair, though, because then that means it's all incognito. We don't know who posed the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, yeah. Yeah. could my name's Nick Bice, I'm from Australia, and I've been involved in the 
Volvo Ocean Race pretty much my whole adult life. I must admit I thought I was coming tonight to get some wires wired into my head. <laughs> you are going to tell me all about myself. It's easy. Um, <laughs> but I've sailed in the race twice before and um, like I said, I've been involved my whole adult life. Still wondering what I'm going to do when I grow up. But um, yeah, let's uh, welcome the rest and okay. bring the questions in. Thank you, Nick. Uh, hello, I'm Antonio Funes. I'm from Lisbon. Um, right now I'm a member of Team Scallywag uh, on the Volvo Ocean Race. I did the last leg in Axon Oval. That was a strange situation. Anyway, uh, and I did the, before the Mini Transat. It's a, a solo race, um, a race across the Atlantic in a mini, a mini boat, a six and a half meter boat uh, alone. So I can all sleep not much. and. Well, all you can imagine. Okay, thank you, Antonio. I'm Gigi Carr. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dee Kafari. Ah. And I'm skippering Turn the Tide on Plastic in the Volvo Ocean Race. It's my sixth time around the world. Um, I've sailed in both directions around the world and uh, done them both solo and now I get the chance to sail with friends, so it's much more sociable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, T. Uh, yeah, Damien Foxhall from Ireland. Uh, this is my sixth Volvo Ocean Race and my tenth Around the World event. Uh, similar to D, I've done quite a lot of crude racing, but some short-handed racing as well. I won the Barcelona Around the World Race, which was just a double-handed race. Uh, nine days, 90 days, three months from start to finish, so um, yeah. I'm with uh, Team Vestas 11th Hour Racing. Hello, I'm Philippa. I live here in Lisbon. I am 41 years old and I'm flight attendant in Top Portugal and I run for six years only. I start with uh, 35 with Helsinki Marathon and I have the possibility with my uh, job to run around all the roads and I win two marathons four years ago the Great Old China Marathon and the Polar Circle, and I'm very happy running. Hi, so I'm Mark Turner. I'm, today I'm the CEO of the Volvo Ocean Race. I, I can't run at all, so I'm feeling pretty, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty humbled amongst people here. Um, and as it says up there, I think I have the distinction of being the ex-sailor. Um, <laughs> So I did the race, the Volvo Ocean Race, when it was known as the Whitbread Around the World Race in 1989, uh, when I was 20, 22 years old. And in 1997, I did the race that Antonio just mentioned, which is single-handed across the Atlantic, with no communication, a single de mini transat. And at that point, I realized, actually, I was better off on land. and never really returned to sea after that. And instead, talked about talking about positive stress and negative stress, chronic stress, I guess I put all that experience into being the person on land helping other people go and do these stupid things. Um, <laughs> and instead starting doing stupid things on land, like uh, walking to the South Pole and swimming stupid distances and sporting the physical side that you explained that I recognize very, very, very well, because I think I need stress. <laughs> I need positive stress. Okay, thank you. Okay, awesome. So. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is an art event about limits, and I guess the first question, of course, is tell us how you pushed your limits, and I think that is actually applying for all of you. So I think we'll do another round table, just asking, like, exactly, w tell us the situation that you were pushed to your limits. What did you do? Um, unfortunately, I did get really pushed to my limit. Um, I actually, during the Volvo Ocean Race, suffered a lot mentally for leaving the dock to spend three weeks at sea, but that wasn't the limit. I was involved in a situation in leg six of the 2005-06 race when we lost someone overboard, um, who we, unfortunately, he drowned. We managed to retrieve him in the middle of the night, get him back on board, but we still had 10 days to go to, to finish the actual leg of the race or to actually get to land. So I was quite a Obviously, as you can imagine, a stressful situation. We had 11 other guys on board and to see the different ways that people were dealing with it was very eye-opening. 
Um, unfortunately, about four days after that, another boat in the race was actually uh, about to sink. So we had to go and, go and rescue them also. So we ended up with all their crew on our boat as well. And uh, as I introduced our crew to them, we all knew each other, of course, but also introduced Hans, who was up in uh, a body bag in the front of the boat. And to see how they actually dealt with the stress as well was uh, quite eye-opening once again. So we're all at sea with each other together, um, unfortunately with someone in a body bag in the boat. Um, and we all went through these different sorts of stages. And um, like I said, it was to see diff people deal with it in different ways was um, something that I thought, you know, you just all deal with it, but we all deal with it a lot differently. Um, to me, it kind of woke me up as into how to deal with other stressful situations. Um, and there's nothing more stressful than that. So when I face a stressful situation now, I, I just definitely know there's a lot worse things. So it did teach me a lesson, um, and I use stress personally myself now to, to strengthen myself, uh, to make better decisions, to deal with different uh, situations in different ways. So that's how I used the stress for me, and that was, well, well, of course, as you can imagine, the most stressful situation I've been involved in. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, one story that I have is um, about the limits. Uh, when I, I, I was doing the mini transit, uh, so we have two legs. One leg is from France to Canary Islands, the second leg from Canary Islands to Caribbean. And uh, actually on the first leg, uh, I was uh, run, uh, passing in front of Lisbon after five days of the start. And uh, basically I haven't slept anything since the start. And uh, I was start, uh, starting to get uh, delusion. And uh, s as the doctor said to me afterwards, uh, I was getting delirious. And uh, actually, I was 50 miles from, from Lisbon, but uh, offshore. And I started to put down the sails and uh, put the fenders off. And uh, because I was thinking that I was getting into a, a harbor, and uh, in the middle of this operation, I saw a flying fish on the on deck. That's a usual sign of that you are offshore because close to the shore you don't see flying fish. And uh, on that delirious situation, I was lucid enough to understand that uh, flying fish are not close to the coast, so I was not going to any harbor because it was pitch dark in the middle of the night. And um, I understood that I was wrong, so I put up the sails. I realized that I was still doing the race. Uh, I've been with this guy side by side because on this race we were 80 boats, so we were always fighting for the, the top places. And um, I was with this guy doing a whole day, and after this situation, I lost the guy. I uh, didn't saw him anymore. So I was very, very disappointed, like very, and uh, the way I deal it was uh, deal with it was uh, just I obliged myself to go to sleep and sleep. We usually we sleep uh, periods of 20 minutes, and uh, I was I went down and I said no I have to sleep, and then the morning after was awful to understand to realize what happened really was more in my in my mind and was really hard. <laughs> I've been kind of trying to think of a story and uh, I realised that I've got loads of stories I could possibly share and I think maybe because I actually spend most of my life pushing my limits and trying to push the boundaries um, and I think my first round the world I was responsible for 17 people on the boat with me some who had sailed some who could sail some who had no idea what they were doing and um, I had a serious injury on board um, and I, I had to press the button on the biggest Southern Ocean rescue there's ever been on New Year's Eve. And I found islands in the Southern Ocean I never even knew existed. Um, and it got to the point where after nine days of keeping this person alive and doing boat to boat transfers of medical supplies, they offered me an airdrop and uh, the reality was I wasn't going to have a body to put the medicine in if they didn't sort it out. So we had to arrange this big medivac. And I thought, 
that was a, a pretty big thing. The end result was a success, unlike Nick's result, but to have that responsibility of someone's life in your hands is quite a big test. And that's probably what led me to go solo around the world after that. <laughs> and I decided it was much easier to um, maybe not be responsible for the 17 other people on board. And I set off on my own around the world and I had never actually sailed on my own before. I'd never lived on my own before. I pretty much had no idea what I was letting myself in for. And many people decided that I was, it was foolish to send me off on this mission. You know, I, I wouldn't manage it, I wouldn't last. And I think I actually used that negative energy by turning it into a positive to damn well prove them wrong and make sure I could deliver. And I learned a lot about myself on that trip a big emotional roller coaster and uh, and now I don't spend the excess energy that's wasted with emotions and it's all very much focused um, on positive energy and I've learned to change a negative language into positive language so not what I don't want to happen